Someday soon, just after the final chords of rock and roll all night ring out on that Shea Stadium stage, I'll pick up my bass and exit stage right. After 29 glorious and tumultuous years, years filled with the highest highs and the lowest lows, America will have seen the last of Kiss on stage. America was our home. These were our people, and playing the final shows will be bittersweet, to say the least. Thirty years before, there was no Kiss. There was only Gene Simmons, an aspiring rock musician in New York City. Ten years before that, there was no Gene Simmons. Only Gene Klein, a Jewish kid who lived in Queens with a single mother. And ten years before that, there wasn't even a Gene Klein. Only Chaim Witz, a poor boy growing up in Haifa, Israel. All those people, of course, were me, and I was all those people. I was born in Israel, saw the world change around me when I came to America with my mother, and then began to change myself, first my name, then my face. When I picked up a bass, it was a kind of transformation. When I put on face paint, it was a kind of transformation. And when I took the stage, it was the most profound transformation of them all. In the process, I managed to help steer Kiss to the pinnacle of rock and roll. We would eventually stand right behind the Beatles in the number of gold record awards by any group in history. As I sit here now reading the book, Kiss is the number one American gold record award champion of all time. In my life story, I am the main character, but countless supporting characters have helped to define my life. First, there's the woman who gave me life, my mother, who endured unspeakable horrors in the concentration camps of the Nazis, who used reserves of strength I can only imagine to survive and even thrive. Then there are my bandmates, my second family, Paul Stanley's like the brother I never had, and Ace Fraley, Peter Chris, Eric Carr, Eric Singer, Bruce Kulick, and others helped me to create and sustain KISS and in some cases did their best to undo what Paul and I had created and sustained. And last but not least, last and probably most, there is lovely, incomparable Shannon Tweed, and the two children of whom we are the proudest parents imaginable, Nicholas and Sophie. When I sat down to write my life story, I thought about it in terms of the books I had read. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that my story is a story about power and the pursuit of it. I've always read everything I could get my hands on, especially books that taught me new things. Religion, philosophy, history, the social sciences, and so forth. There are thousands of books, from African Genesis to World Lit by Fire, that recount man's endless search for power. Ultimately, all conflicts seem to center on it. On who has it and who wants it. I instinctively realized very early on that power was what I really wanted. Fame and riches are fine, but one can have both and still have no power. Power is something I craved from the first time I set foot in America. I was made fun of because I couldn't speak English or because I was Jewish, but it really came down to not having power. Someone, perhaps Machiavelli, once said, It's better to be feared than loved. I understand that. Love is evasive. Love has its needs. You have to be giving. You have to be concerned with someone else's happiness. Power is a clearer idea, a cleaner concept. I want to walk into a restaurant and be waited on. I want to have women want me, although not necessarily because I want them. Women understand this notion very well. A woman wants to make herself as attractive as she can, with makeup, clothing, and perfume, because she wants every man to want her, although she may not be interested in any of them. I realize that I'm painting with broad strokes here, but I stand by what I'm saying. I suppose one of the reasons I wanted power was so I wouldn't get picked on. When I first came to America, I felt like a stranger in a strange land. The Robert Heinlein book spoke to me as no other book ever had. It was my story. I was singled out because I was different, because I didn't speak English well, because I was alone. So I figured I didn't need anyone, didn't want anyone, and had only myself to depend on. If I didn't do the work and go and get it myself, it would certainly never be handed to me. The story of Kiss, of Gene Simmons, is the story of an ambition and good fortune of an immigrant boy's impossible dream realized. But it's also a story of the world's biggest rock band, which means there's plenty of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I can't take credit for any of the drugs. I'm straight, never been drunk, not a single time in my life. But the sex? For much of my adult life, I had no girlfriends, although I had plenty of girls. More than plenty. At some point, I began to keep Polaroid snapshots of my liaisons, to remember them by, in a certain way, I loved every one of them, but when it was over, it was over. No fuss, no muss, no agony. To date, 
I have had about 4,600 liaisons. And I have to say they were all wonderful. They all enhanced my life in so many ways. Food tasted better. I whistled and hummed. I was alive. Somehow, through all the craziness with women, despite the sheer numbers, I managed to become a dedicated father. If this seems strange to you, think of how it seems to me. My father left my mother and me when I was still young, and I grew up convinced that I would never have children, in part because I remembered the pain of abandonment, in part because I lived in terror of repeating my father's mistakes. Then I met a girl named Shannon Tweed. The next thing I knew, I was holding my son in the hospital, unwilling to give him up to the doctors. How do I reconcile the coxman with the family man? The same way I reconcile the shy immigrant boy with a leather and studs demon who climbed on stage to breathe fire. Every personality has contradictions, and a large personality has large contradictions. I have lived my life for myself. I'm not afraid to admit that, but I've also lived my life for the fans, for the faithful soldiers in the KISS army, those who stood by us through thick and thin, through changing fashion, those who braved bad traffic and bad weather to come out and let us entertain them. When I first sat down to write this book, I was torn by whether I should tell the truth about their band, about the internal rifts and feuds, the personality conflicts and personality disorders. I was torn because I feared that the truth might ruin people's perception of their heroes. And whatever else Kiss was, it was about heroes, about magic, about believing in it and delivering the goods. You, the fans, have always deserved the best from us. It's one of the reasons why we introduced ourselves at every show with... You wanted the best, you got the best. The hottest band in the world, KISS. In sickness and in health, whether we felt like it or not, we believed we had an obligation to get out there, play our hearts out, and give you everything we had. I believe that when children grow up, they should find out the truth about their parents. Those of you who believe in KISS need to know the truth. I know that a lot of the things you'll read in this book will be hard to take. I know that some fans may get upset at me. I know that some members of the band will hate me more than ever and claim that everything between these two covers is a lie. Despite my memory, despite the documentation, despite the witnesses who will attest to the events. Either way, here's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Great Expectations Israel, 1949-1958 I was born August 25th, 1949, in a hospital in Haifa, Israel, overlooking the Mediterranean. At birth, I was named Chaim Vitz. Chaim is a Hebrew word that means life, and Vitz was my father's last name. Just a year earlier, Israel had become independent, after roughly 100 million Arabs tried to prevent Israel from appearing on the world map. The war for Israel's independence followed in the wake of an earlier war, World War II and the terrible plan of the German Nazis to erase Jews from Europe and eventually the world. My mother's parents were Hungarian Jews, and my mother had grown up in Hungary during the 1920s and 1930s. When my mother was 14, she was sent to the concentration camps, where she saw most of her family wiped out in the gas chambers. While in the camps, she ended up doing the hair of the commandant's wife, so she was shielded from many of the horrors that befell the other Jews. Having survived that horrific time, after the war she went to Israel. I think the survival instinct was so strong among that generation that, after leaving the camps, they couldn't imagine failing at anything else, and so they set out for this strange new land. Israel was a new country, only a year older than I was, and its existence was still very much in question. But I was unaware of all that. It was always such a part of my daily routine that I wasn't able to separate it from any other aspect of my experience. For example, I remember that my dad, Yechiel, or Ferry, Witz, who was physically imposing, oh, at least six foot five, would come in on the weekends with his machine gun and put it on the kitchen table. The front lines were 50 miles away, and everybody, every male and most females, was in the army. There were no exceptions. If you lived there, you were in the army. The gun on the table was one of the few things I remember about my father, because he wasn't around very much. I do recall that he was this large, powerful being with a large, powerful presence. One vivid memory does stand out. Once there was a mouse in the house, and it ran across the room under the couch. And I remember my dad picking up the couch and holding it on one side with one arm, 
while he was trying to shoo the mouse away with the other. I couldn't believe it. A man lifting up a couch? This was like nothing I'd ever seen before. It seemed impossible. I had polio when I was a very young child, probably when I was about three years old. Apparently, I lost most of my muscle control from the waist down. The doctors were worried that it would get worse and sent me to the hospital. In the hospital, I was kept off the ward, in isolation. And when my mother and my father came by, they had to communicate with me through a closed window. For some reason at that age, I had a strong sense of what was proper and what was improper. And I knew that it was improper to go to the bathroom in your own bed. My mother potty trained me early on. She showed me the toilet and explained what it was for. At that time, there were no diapers in Israel, and I learned quickly that the bed was for sleeping and the bathroom was for your other business. It was very clear. In the hospital, in the ward, I needed to get out of the bed and use the bathroom. I complained and cried and complained some more. I knew I needed to get to the bathroom. I knew that any other solution to that problem was the wrong solution. But the nurse didn't come and somehow I managed to pull myself over the baby crib and did my business on the floor while I hung on to the side of the crib. Then the nurse came. She wasn't around when I was in trouble, but the minute there was poop on the floor, she came right by, and she started yelling at me, wondering why I had gone right outside the crib. And my mother stormed right in and screamed at her for not being there for me. What did you expect him to do, she said. Go in his own bed? He's a good boy. He knows better. In her eyes... I could do no wrong. I was always a loner. Even though I had friends, I spent time by myself, observing things, organizing the world around me in my own mind. For example, I was fascinated with beetles. In Israel, they had these huge Old Testament beetles. The beetles here in America are nothing compared to them. These Israeli beetles were the size of small dinosaurs, maybe two inches long. They were brightly colored and beautiful. They looked like jewels and I used to tie sewing thread around the neck of these beetles and put them in matchboxes along with a little bit of sugar. The beetles would live there until I opened up the box and then they would fly around, still tied to my thread. Sometimes I put them in my mouth to impress the girls. As I got older, I became less of a loner. Instead, I became more interested in showing off around other kids and getting attention. So I changed from the kind of kid who would be a falconer for beetles, letting them fly around at the end of a leash of thread, to the kind of kid who would put a beetle in his mouth and let it walk around in there. Other kids were amazed by that. They thought it was disgusting and brave. Most importantly, they couldn't look away. Though I was born in Haifa, my family lived in a place nearby, a little village called Tirat HaKarmel, which is named for the original biblical Mount Carmel. And I remember as a kid climbing that mountain, which is more of a hill, really, rolling hills, similar to Southern California's hills. I remember going up the hill and picking cactus fruit when I was a kid, then climbing back down and selling the fruit at the bus depot for half a puta, which is basically half a penny. Cactus fruit are sweet and juicy on the inside, but have spikes on the outside. Their Hebrew name is Sabra, and that's what Israelis are called, because they too are prickly on the outside and sweet on the inside. Living in Israel among all the other Sabras was strange, especially in school because Israeli classrooms taught this quirky mix of history, religion, and politics. Think of it. In class, we were taught about an old book called the Bible, and were told the events recounted in this book, incredible events really, actually took place in the country where we were living. It was a strange notion to swallow and to understand, because here was a whole book that talked about the creation of life, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the flood, and the exodus, and then we were told... This is where it happened. You're living in the place. It was pretty heavy stuff. At the same time, I wasn't really all that conscious of being Jewish in Israel, because almost everyone was the same as I was in that respect. Clearly, there were Arabs walking down the street, and there were some Christians, but I was oblivious to all that. I was not aware of anything except being Israeli. You'd think that my mother, having just come through the war in the concentration camps, would have been consumed with what had happened to her, but she wasn't. It was too painful for her to talk about. She never discussed the camps and rarely talked about her childhood in Hungary. All she ever talked about, and only every once in a great while, was that the world is a big place and there are some good people and some bad people. To this day, I am amazed that she had that self-control. It's proof that my mother ethically, morally, and in all other ways, is a much better person than I will ever be. She had at that time and still has 
an abiding trust in humanity. She still believed the world is a good place, and that goodness prevails over evil more often than not. I don't know that I would have had that point of view if I had lived through what she had. When you're a kid, you don't know that people are different races, different ethnicities, different religions. The only thing I did notice about my neighborhood was that it was filled with different languages. Some of the Jews in Israel spoke Hebrew, some spoke Yiddish, which is a European language that combines Hebrew and German. In my house, the most important language was Hungarian, because my mother didn't really speak Hebrew all that well. And then later, when my mother went to work, it was Turkish, and then Spanish, because my babysitter was Turkish, and the next-door neighbors were Spanish. At an early age, I was able to speak Hebrew, Hungarian, Turkish, and Spanish. I was not aware of America or the rest of the world, but I do remember my mother taking me to a movie. I must have been four. It was my first experience with non-reality-based images. I had never seen a television set, and I had heard radio only occasionally. We went to the movie, and we couldn't afford to go inside, so my mother held me in her lap outside of the theater, and we watched the movie, which was shown on a big screen without a roof. It was amazing. I was transfixed. Later I remembered that it was Broken Arrow with Jimmy Stewart and Jeff Chandler. But at that time, all I could see were huge images of cowboys and Indians and a mythical Wild West where there were outlaws and heroes. Cowboys were the first superheroes as far as I was concerned, the first characters who were larger than life and more powerful than ordinary people. As important as all of this became to me later, the concept of heroes and the magic of the movies, what made the greatest impression on me was the sound of American English. That might have been the first time I heard English, and it sounded funny to me. It was one of the languages that, as a kid in Israel, we mimicked. To my ears, the American language had its own sound with lots of Ys and lots of soft Rs. These sounds didn't exist in Hebrew. That was my fake English, and it sounded pleasant to me. From the beginning, it seemed my father and my mother would separate. A simple conflict lay at the heart of my parents' bad marriage. My mother, Flora, was extremely beautiful as a young woman. She had classic movie star looks, like Ava Gardner. In the village where they came from in Europe, Yand, Hungary, she was considered quite a catch, but not as big a catch as my father. He was highly valued because he was the tallest in the village, probably 6'5 or 6'6". Although I remember him as even bigger, in my memory, he was 6'9", a giant. Though his name is Yechiel in Hebrew, he was called Feri in Hungarian. When they met and married, they were young, in their twenties, and during the first few years of their marriage, my mother gradually woke up to the idea that my father wasn't going to be the kind of provider she needed. For some reason, he could never make ends meet. He could never run a business successfully. He was not really a pragmatist. He was more of a dreamer. And for a carpenter, being a dreamer was roughly equivalent to being unemployed. He would make pieces of furniture that he loved, but nobody else liked, and he would find, to his surprise, that he couldn't sell them. But it was more important to him to do what he wanted to do. And I remember he whittled me a scooter with his own two hands. Not an electric scooter, but the push kind, the ones with wheels and a little platform. He made it for me for my birthday. It was always impressive to see what he could make, and I'm sure that my mother was happy that he got off on his own creativity. But at some point you have to begin to submit to practical needs as well. Namely, how do you make money? He didn't know the answer, and she kept asking the question, and they fought all the time. Even if we had been living in a secure country with a secure middle class, they probably still would have fought. But we were at the edge of this new frontier, in this new country, with new neighbors, new languages, and new rules. So my mother's anxiety about these issues intensified. Whether because of her pressure or my father's own self-esteem issues, their arguments would sometimes devolve to physical violence. Not terrible beatings, and not one-sided either. I remember that every once in a while, one of them would push the other. At one point, I must have been four or so, they were bickering back and forth. And I jumped on my father's leg and and started biting him near his knee. I can't even say for certain that it was a serious fight, but I was just trying to protect my mother. Things didn't get better, and the fact that they weren't getting better made things worse. My father left Haifa for Tel Aviv to look for work and take some time away from my mother. 
When he was gone, my mother started working at a coffee house called Cafe Nitsa. I'll never forget it, because when you first pulled up to it, you saw a kind of Mama Beulah figure, a large, fat, happy black woman sipping coffee. Up until that point, I think I'd never seen a black face of any kind. She was so big and so happy, that face on the sign. I remember as a kid going to see my mother and getting my first cup of coffee and a poppy seed cake. I remember being hit by that caffeine and I thought I was going to pass out. I couldn't believe what was happening to me. Everything started moving at a different speed. In my mind, I thought I was slurring my words. My mother liked working. It gave her self-esteem and she was very disciplined and a very hard worker. But still, she wanted to make her marriage work. One day she told me that we were going to see my dad. So we took a trip to Tel Aviv, and we searched in vain for him for a while. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. He wasn't in any of the places my mother expected to find him. So we went to the movies. I don't know if my mother suspected he might be there. I don't know if she was just going to relax for a while. But in the lobby, I caught sight of my father. He was at the top of the stairs with a blonde woman. I turned to my mother and I told her, There's Dad with a blonde woman. At the time, I didn't think of it in terms of jealousy. That didn't enter into it at all. It was more like a game, looking for my father, and I had won the game by spotting him at the top of the stairs with this blonde woman. My mother knew differently. We went to his apartment, and somehow she got a passkey, and we went inside, and she went through his pockets and found condoms in one of them. We went back to Haifa, and the two of us continued with our lives, and that was the last of my father's role. He didn't surface again. I have no idea whether my mother tried to make contact privately, and she won't talk about it to this day. For me, as a child, that was the end of that. The last visual image that I had of my dad was at the top of the stairs with that other woman. After that, it was just the two of us, my mother and me, and she devoted herself to raising me. She went out on a date or two with some guys and would always do her best to explain to me what was happening. I didn't react very well, probably because I thought that I would lose her affections to somebody else. I became jealous and guarded, and I let her know in no uncertain terms that nobody else was permitted in the arrangement. One way or another, it worked, because my mother stayed single until I was about 18 or 19. Shortly after my mother and father separated for good, my mother and I moved from Tirat HaKarmel to Vadi Jamal, another village in the Haifa area. At that time, I was five or six, and starting to get a sense of the kind of country I was living in. For starters, it was a country that was just finding its way. Israel worked on a food stamp system, and you could have meat once a week. Even milk wasn't something you could just go and buy. You had to get your stamp. There were certain amenities we simply didn't have. I never saw toilet paper or tissues. We wiped with rags. They were washed. Showers were unheard of. I bathed in a metallic bathtub, and my mother would heat the water up on the stove and then pour it into the bathtub, pot by pot, until it filled up. Despite that, I was mostly oblivious to the idea of rich and poor. There were bullet holes all over the walls in the apartment where we lived, because three years earlier, the Arabs and the Jews were fighting the War of Independence in the streets. But I was oblivious to the bullet holes. It just looked like a building. I do remember one incident. Every once in a while, my mother would save up money to bake a babka, which is a thick pastry. When she made the frosting to cover the cake, she would let me stick my finger in the pot and taste it. I remember being horrified that there was a big hole in the middle of the pot, and I was embarrassed to say anything to my mother at the time because I thought she would feel embarrassed herself. But when I did happen to mention it, she started laughing because, in fact, the babka pot that you cook in actually has that big hole in the middle. To me, though, it was just a broken pot and a sign of our poverty. I was my mother's only child. There were no other children, no husband. As a result, she protected me fiercely. We were a team, and she was intent, both on raising me right and on ensuring that other people treated me with respect. Some of my most vivid memories are of my mother defending me, which she did passionately. I guess it was her way of announcing to the world that she valued her son and expected the same from everyone else. My mother used to have these huge thigh-high boots, the kind that plumbers wear as opposed to the stylish boots that are more familiar to Americans. They were very clunky, and I remember watching those boots go through the dirt as I walked along behind her. One day, walking along behind those boots, 
I saw a neighborhood boy who had a bad habit of throwing rocks. Or more to the point, he had a bad habit of throwing rocks at me. I was minding my own business, and suddenly, a rock hit me in the head. My mother moved faster than I had ever seen her move. She chased down this kid and picked him up off the ground by his hand and smacked him so hard that he was swinging like a sack of potatoes. This kid was crying, but she couldn't or wouldn't stop hitting him. She just kept slapping him. Then she took me by the hand in front of his parents, as if to say, Yeah, what are you going to do about it? Nothing came of it. We walked away. Another time, my mother's protectiveness actually landed us in the police station. This was slightly later, after I had started school in Vadi Jamal, and after I had established myself as the loud kid, the show-off, the kid who always had to go the farthest, the highest, the fastest. There was a fig tree that grew over into the school grounds, although it was rooted in the yard of the woman who lived next door. The kids loved to climb up the part of the tree that was in the schoolyard, then climb down into the neighbor's yard. When she came out, all the kids would clamber down and scurry away. I was usually the last one down because I was in the highest branches. One time I was too slow coming down, and the woman caught me. She had a banana stalk in her hand, and she started hitting me with it. I don't remember how badly she hurt me, only that I was scared and that she knocked the wind out of me. My friends brought me home after school and told my mother about the beating, in front of me. The next thing I knew, we were back in the street again and I was behind my mother and her boots, and we were going to the woman's house. We got to the house, and my mother banged on the door, and the woman came out. I remember being struck by her size. She was big, bigger than my mother, and had a hard look. She must have had a hard life. My mother asked just two questions. The first one was, Did you hit my son? The woman said, Yeah, he climbed my tree, and anybody that does that is trying to steal my figs, and I will hit anybody that I see. The second question was, what did you hit him with? My mother spoke levelly, as if she were just trying to collect information. The woman said, I'll show you what I hit him with. She brought out the banana stalk. My mother grabbed the stalk out of the woman's hands and started beating her over the head with it. At first, my mother was swinging it with one hand, and then she had it two-handed, as if she were playing baseball and she was bringing it down on the woman's head, hard, the way you do with a sledgehammer over a spike. This woman was being drilled into the ground. The woman's legs gave way, and she was on her butt against the doorway. But even then, my mother kept banging her over the head. By the time my mother got through with this woman, I was just amazed, because I'd never seen blood literally spray out of a person's head like a sprinkler system. It was just spouting out. It almost looked comical. There was blood everywhere. The woman was covered with blood, and my mother was covered with blood. It was hard to believe. It felt almost like a cheap horror movie. In short order, because it was a small town, the police were there. There was a police station around the corner from the school. The cops took my mother and myself. We walked, because there were no cop cars, two blocks to the station. The sergeant behind the desk had a huge mustache. You couldn't see his mouth. It just hung over his lips. Did you, he said to my mother, and before he could even finish, she nodded. Yes, she said. Yes, I hit her over the head. The sergeant asked her why, and she told the story and explained her thinking. Whether her son was right or wrong, she said, no one was allowed to lay a hand on him, and then she got carried away because it was emotional in the retelling, and she must have felt defiant, and she started to yell at the sergeant and told him, If you even so much as look at my son in the wrong way, I'll split your head open too. The sergeant repeated that with an expression of disbelief, and the rest of the cops started laughing. Then he let us go. When I look back on Israel, I find that most of my memories are about my mother or clothing, or food. The basics. I left when I was still a child, so my personality didn't really come into its own there. But every once in a while, a memory comes up that surprises me with its strength and explains something about myself. For many years, for example, I couldn't stand the sight of spiders. I dimly remember an incident from my childhood, but it wasn't clear. Then it came back to me. One morning, my mother was getting ready to go to work, and I was getting ready to go to school. And she put my hat on my head. It didn't quite fit. There was a lump in it. She took off the hat, saying something about how my hair must be crumpled underneath. While she was talking, the biggest spider I ever saw crawled out of that hat and ran away. I shrieked, and for years I couldn't get over the idea that there were spiders waiting for me. I had a habit of looking under clothing and hats, and in pockets to see if anything was crawling inside. 
There's a similar story with chickens. Across the street from us lived a Moroccan family who always treated me as one of their own. One of the daughters in that family was named Jeannette. She was a little older than I was. She must have been 12 to my five or six. She would always treat me to these huge cucumber butter and bread sandwiches when I came over. That was how we did things then. You'd have your bread and put on it a piece of vegetable and lots of butter, and that was your sandwich. It was great. I was always looking forward to spending time at her place. Her family had this chicken, a royal chicken with red plumage, and I always used to give it crumbs from my pockets. As soon as the chicken saw me walking in, it would start clucking. I guess it figured that it was feeding time at the zoo. One day, I walked into Jeannette's place, expecting to get a sandwich, but she said she had to go, and she was pulling the chicken by a leash. It was fluttering its wings, and cluck, 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 it wouldn't go. She tried to force it, but it resisted. So I said, let me pick up the chicken, he likes me. I reached for the chicken, but she said, no, don't do that, he's going to peck your eyes out. I ignored her and picked up this giant chicken, and it settled into my arms like a newborn baby, and we walked. I didn't know where we were going, but I was brave enough to carry it. After a little while, though, the chicken started to weigh on me. It was probably five pounds. So I asked Jeanette how far we were walking. Very close, she said. It's just up around the corner. As we rounded the corner, a large man with an apron came and grabbed the chicken from my arms. He held it by the neck and snapped it, then produced a knife and cut its head off. I saw the body of the chicken running around while the head was in the man's hand. It was the most hideous thing I had ever seen. Because of this memory, I couldn't eat chicken in any way, shape, or form especially if the head was connected with the wings and all that. You'd think this would be a trauma that would pass, but until my mid-thirties, if I was going to eat chicken, it would have to be amorphous and not look like a chicken. With all this, it was a good time. My needs were simple because they had to be. As long as I had jam and bread, I was happy. To this day, I find fancy food, like French pastries and baby carrots, disgusting. Give me a nice piece of cake, and I'm in heaven. Rocket Ride, Coming to America, 1958 to 1963. One day, my mother and I received a care package in the mail. Inside, there were cans of food and a sweater. It was the first time I had ever seen canned goods. My mother explained to me that it had come from her Uncle Joe and her brother, George Klein. This was the first time I had ever heard of a brother. In fact, she had two brothers. In Hungary before the war, they had gotten wind that something bad was on the way, so they had gone to New York City. I asked my mother why they were sending us things. As I said, I didn't have any strong sense of privation. I didn't feel poor. I had food and clothing. Then she opened up the cans, and I tasted my first canned peaches, which I thought were just astonishing. I went to her with the peaches still in my mouth and said, Where did this come from? She said, America. It wasn't the first time I had heard that word but it was the first time I could attach a concrete sensation to it. In this case, the peaches in my mouth. I remember thinking it was a funny-sounding name, partly because I was giving it the Hebrew pronunciation with a hard R. I went around the house saying, America, for days. Pretty soon the word began to collect other associations. One of the first was cowboys. Once I recognized that America was a land of cowboys, that was enough to make me think more about it. I was eight and a half by then, and movies were bigger than the entire world, and a big part of movies was the cowboy myth. This was before rock and roll, before the Beatles. At that point, cowboys were the ultimate cool. They got the girl, they were the loners, they rode off into the sunset. And cowboys represented America, at least for all the kids who weren't there. If you were a cowboy, you could exist in this pure, heroic world. You could live by the gun. You were the judge and the jury and you meted out justice with your hands, and you just moved on, and the girls loved you. You went off into the sunset. In one school play, I dressed up as a cowboy with a toy gun my mother bought me. It was the only costume that made sense. In fact, I was the small-town kid playing cowboy with not an ounce of cool in me. But I was dreaming about cowboys, and through that, I was dreaming about America. I don't think I consciously understood it at all, but I would look up at the movie screen and see this other place where everything was just much more dramatic and much bigger. The thing about America that always came through loud and clear was its size. 
The word was big, the people were big, the ideas were big, the women were big, their breasts were big, the horses were big, and they had buffaloes there which were big, and big trains, everything was big. And for me it was about to become a reality. One day my mother told me to get dressed, because we were going to the airport. I had never seen an airport. I had never seen jets or planes or anything, so I was transfixed. Then as we started to walk down the tarmac, it occurred to me that maybe I should show a little interest in this process. So I said to my mother, where are we going? And my mother said, we're just going one stop. I thought we were going on a trip, so we got on the plane and stayed there. The trip seemed like an eternity, partly because it was a long flight and partly because I was sick as a dog. I had never felt so terrible before, not in my entire life. I just kept vomiting and vomiting. I must have thrown up everything I ate that morning and everything from the day before and the day before that. Finally, we landed in Paris. I remember stopping in Paris only because my mother went out to the duty-free area to buy herself some perfume. Then we got back on the plane, and I was sick again. And finally, we landed at LaGuardia Airport in New York. For me as a kid, this was a new world, and I was trying to soak it all up. Later, though, I learned two stories about my mother's experiences in this immigration process that helped me to understand it better. At the time, only a small number of people were allowed to come to the United States from Israel. My mother was very striking as a young woman, and apparently she convinced one of the authorities, either with her looks or with her people skills, to move our papers out from the bottom of the pile and to the top. That way we were able to get out of Israel and come to the United States. That's the first story. The second one involves the fact that my mother had to take an oath before leaving Israel. She saw the American official at the embassy, and he couldn't speak Hebrew, and she couldn't speak English. They fumbled around and eventually hit on a common language, German. He asked her a series of questions about her political beliefs. They were trying to gauge her suitability for coming to America. The first question was, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Those were the kinds of things that people were asked in those days. Literally, are you a member of the Communist Party? Do you have secret plans to overthrow the American government? Who's going to say yes? She said no. So the interview went fine, and then it came time for her to take this oath. And the official said, please raise your right hand. I guess my mother was a bit flustered at the time, and Jews don't do the same swearing on the Bible that Christians do, so she stuck her hand straight out the way Nazis do. He started laughing, and he told my mother, No, don't worry. You'll never have to do that ever again. That was very profound, I think. That marked the change we were about to undergo. The Nazis had hung over her like a shadow ever since the war. It was so painful that she didn't like to talk about it, but now... We were going somewhere that would help make all that a distant memory. When we got to New York City, my mother and I went to stay with her brother Larry and his wife Magda in Flushing, Queens. I was at that time no longer Chaim Witz. I had taken the name Jean for my first name because it was more American than Chaim, and I had taken Klein because it was my mother's maiden name. In Old Testament Jewish law, it's a matriarchal society, so once your father leaves or dies, your mother's maiden name becomes your name. So I was not Chaim Witz, Israeli. I was Jean Klein, New American. And I do mean New American. I was eight and a half years old when we arrived, and there were so many things that I just couldn't understand, things that were so foreign to me. One of the first things I remember seeing was a Christmas billboard for Kent cigarettes with a picture of Santa Claus smoking. He had this big cherubic face, and in the background, the reindeer were up in the sky, waiting for Santa to join them. Since I had never really heard of Christ, or Christmas, or Santa Claus, I immediately thought, oh, that's a rabbi smoking a cigarette. I figured that he must have been a Russian rabbi, because of all the snow in the background. The other impression I had was that the place exceeded my imagination in every possible way. There's this stereotype of foreigners who come to America. They keep their heads up, so they can see all of these unimaginable vistas, streets that never end, rows of houses that never end. Coming from Israel, there was nothing to prepare me, and that's exactly how I was. I walked around with my head up and my eyes wide open. As usual, the best way I can describe how I felt is, with a scene from a movie, although it's a movie that would come out a number of years later, Moscow on the Hudson with Robin Williams. He plays a guy who comes to America from Russia, and he's fresh off the boat, and he goes into a supermarket and walks up to one of the floor managers and says, Excuse me, which way is coffee? in his broken English. And the floor manager, polite as can be, says, aisle 13. Aisle 13? What does that mean? So the guy says again, aisle 13, sir. All of aisle 13. So when Robin Williams goes down to that aisle, 
There are literally hundreds of brands of coffee. He can't believe his eyes. He just starts repeating the word coffee, 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 and eventually he collapses and all the coffee falls on him. That was my experience of America. The stores were like football fields full of food. I had never seen anything so big. In Israel, there was no such thing as brands. You wanted milk, you got milk. You wanted eggs, you got eggs. Here, there were hundreds of kinds of breads, hundreds of kinds of meat. And when you walked outside, people were wearing hundreds of kinds of shoes and hats, driving hundreds of kinds of cars. I would like to say that I quickly grew sophisticated in America, but the truth is far different. When I first walked into my Uncle George's house, which, like his brother Larry's, was also in Flushing, Queens, it must have been around dinner time one night, and the television was tuned to the news. In those days, television sets were huge, six feet long or so, and most of the piece was furniture because it was the centerpiece of the room. It was considered bad taste just to have a TV screen. So here I come, fresh off the plane, and there's a close-up of a man's face on the screen reading the news. I actually went around behind the furniture to see where the guy was. That was my first impression of television, which later bloomed into a full-fledged love affair. But at the time, it was just another thing that I didn't really understand. The refrigerator was another source of amazement for me. I opened it up and found these huge bottles of soda. And I didn't even have a word for it yet. I called them gazoz, the Hebrew word for soda. Then there was Bosco chocolate syrup, which I used to squirt directly into my mouth, and ketchup, which I loved so much that I used to make ketchup sandwiches. My cousins would just sit at the table and watch me eat because of the combinations of foods that I would invent. Wonder Bread was like cake to me. We would sit down to dinner, and I'd just start eating slice after slice of Wonder Bread. And my aunt and my mom would say, No, 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 you, you have to eat right. And I would think, Eat right? What's wrong with this? That first year, my life changed, and changed again. My Uncle Larry had two daughters, and they were older than I was. And though they were kind to me, they viewed me as a curiosity. One of my cousins, Eva, let me ride her bike, which I thought was a gift from heaven. I rode it around the block what must have been a hundred times. A native-born American kid would have just crossed the street. But I had never crossed the street before, and there were cars going by, and I didn't know what to do. In Israel, we didn't have stop signs, red lights, or green lights, at least not where I lived. So I kept going around the block. I didn't feel limited, though. It was fantastic just to ride around and around the block. Then one day I saw two kids on the other side playing marbles. Up until then, I hadn't had much interaction with other kids, because I would start talking to them, and pretty soon I would get this strange look and this series of questions. What? What are you, stupid? Can't you speak English? And I couldn't. I could barely understand anything. But these kids playing marbles intrigued me, because I had four or five marbles that my cousins let me have, and I also had skills. Back in Israel, I had been very adept at playing marbles, and the Israeli style of playing marbles was different. In America, you used your thumb as the aiming mechanism, but in Israel, you played standing up. I knew that I could hit a marble standing up from maybe four or five feet away. These guys saw me coming across the street and knew that I was a rube, and they tried to take my marbles away. They explained the rules, and I quickly understood that there was a circle, and anything you hit out of the circle with your marble was yours. If your marble stayed in there, you lost your turn. By the end of the day, I won all their marbles, well over a hundred. I've still got all those marbles saved in the same Dutch master's cigar box that my Aunt Magda gave me. Those kids didn't think I was stupid in the end. I loved being with my uncles. My Uncle Larry was a baker. He made cakes. So he was my hero. One of his best, and one of my favorites, was this amazing poppy seed cake. And my Uncle George was a prosthodontist. He made teeth for people who wore false teeth. He also made fake testicles for people who had lost their own. I'm not making that up. Both Larry and George worked hard and made good livings, and they were very generous to my mother and me. Still, about a year after we came to America, my mother decided that she needed to strike out on her own rather than stay with her brother. My Uncle Larry was happy to have us, but we were living in the basement, and she wanted to go to work and make her own way. So within a year, she put me into a Hasidic yeshiva, the Jewish equivalent of a theological seminary, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, while she worked at a button and buttonhole factory. The factory was non-union, a sweatshop, and she made a penny for every button that she sewed onto a coat. She was making about $150 a week, which was a lot of money at that time, and an awful lot of buttons. She had to lift the coat, sew on one button, and then the next, and then lift each completed coat and hang it on a hanger. It was seven until seven, six days a week, of back-breaking work. 
While my mother was at the button factory, I was staying with a family in Williamsburg, the Shiners. They were part of the Hasidic Jewish support system, people in the community who accepted boarders to give kids a chance to go yeshiva. They didn't have any kids of their own. They were an older couple, or seemed older, although they were probably in their 40s. They were very kind to me, and I remember seeing the first private telephone in someone's house. It was another wondrous sight. My schedule was grueling. It wasn't the button factory, of course, but at 7 o'clock in the morning, wearing a yarmulke and dressed in black, I started in on a very thorough Jewish religious schooling. The first half of the day was spent on the Old Testament, Torah studies and Bible stories. Then we had a half-hour break, and by 12.30 we were back in school for fundamental academics, reading, writing, arithmetic, and so on. At 6, when we were already tired from the school day, we would move from one building at 206 Wilson Street in Williamsburg to another building at South 3rd Street and Bedford Avenue and gather for a group meal. Then after the meal, we would have more class, evening Bible study until 9.30. Then when I would go home to the Shiners, I would have homework. This was six days a week, not five. On Saturdays, we were expected to go to temple, both in the morning and in the evening. With this kind of schedule, one thing was for certain. You were never going to get into trouble. I lived in a poor area, but it was a happy neighborhood. We didn't know any better. Slowly, I learned how to get around in this new world, and I learned to speak English, which wasn't always easy. One of my early language lessons was with the phrase, come here. I thought it meant, come here. But what I didn't realize was that there were two different phrases. One was, come here, and that meant, come here. The other was, come here, and that meant, I'm going to kick your ass. Originally, with my extremely limited English, I wore a name tag with my address saying, please point me in the direction of this address. Even when I was able to get by, after about a year, I still sounded like Latka, Andy Kaufman's character from Taxi. I would say, what time it is, instead of, what time is it? And I had a very thick accent. I remember other kids constantly making fun of me. What's the matter, they would say. Are you stupid? Can't you even speak English? That always struck me as bizarre. I always knew the difference between being stupid and simply not being able to speak a language. It's okay, though. Later on in life, they would all work for me. America was many things to me. It was a new language. It was new family. It was economic opportunity. But above all, it was entertainment, television, comic books, and the movies. Kids who grew up during the 50s say that they were raised by television, and sometimes they say it in this self-pitying tone, like they missed out on something. For me, it was the best experience I ever had. That first summer out in Queens was all about television. All the other kids wanted to go out and play baseball. I didn't care about baseball. Once I discovered television, why would I ever want to leave home? It was free. And there were endless, endless shows, and they weren't confined to the Earth. There was Planet Patrol, which went into outer space, and the Vikings, and Superman. All those images are indelibly etched in my mind forever. And magically, I started to speak English with a Walter Cronkite flavor to my accent. Television led naturally to movies. When I did get a chance to go, I went to a theater in Williamsburg in Brooklyn, where, for 25 cents, I got to see three movies and cartoons. The theater was right under the elevated subway, and when I first started to go to Yeshiva, I remember wanting to go to the movies so much. I had never been inside a movie theater in my life. In Israel, they set up benches and a screen outside, and we watched at night. So, one day I just stood outside the theater, looking at the poster on the wall. There was a John Wayne movie. There were always John Wayne movies, and Gorgo was playing. That was a Godzilla ripoff. At 10 a.m. in the morning, there I was, waiting for people to start going in. Eventually, the theater owner came by, and a truck delivered the film canisters. The owner took one look at me and said, If you carry this all the way up to the projection booth, I'll let you come in, and you can have popcorn. The film must have weighed as much as I did. The canisters felt like a body bag, but I carried them up, all the way up, one step at a time, with both hands. I remember thinking my hands were going to fall off, because I'd never lifted anything so heavy. But I got it done, and the rest of that day I was the king. I sat all the way up in the top tier, and ate popcorn until I almost threw up. It was one of the most amazing days of my life. Television had the same effect, except it was easier because it was free and at home. At first, it didn't matter what I was watching. It was all America. Over time, I developed favorites based on costumes, and the bolder they were, the better. On television, I never missed Superman. I'd watch the Mickey Mouse Club, but I didn't like the girls on the show. They did girl things. They danced around and cooed and couldn't run as fast as the guys. 
and the guys would always have to watch out for them, and they would just get in the way. The guys did Spin and Marty stuff. They were adventurers. I do remember watching the Vikings on television, which was a series based on the movie, I suppose. I remember Jet Jackson, this guy with a big, fast jet. And I remember the cartoons, especially the Warner Brothers cartoons. I enjoyed Tom and Jerry, but there was never a sophisticated storyline, only the chase. Although they were beautifully drawn and the gags were funny, the different levels that Bugs and Daffy worked on were astonishing. There were a lot of in-jokes, double entendres, sexual innuendos. Bugs Bunny dressing up as a woman, marrying Elmer Fudd. It was just the most outrageous stuff. Many years later, after home videotaping became popular, I used to tape Saturday morning cartoons and watch them over and over again. Even if I had company at the house, other musicians, actors, celebrities, I was intent on watching these cartoons. People didn't understand my obsession, but then a few years after that, everyone acknowledged these cartoons as seminal works of post-war American art. But I always knew they were. Overall, I was drawn to any...